helping. Um, yeah, I, I pitched the show. I think I told you a little bit about mm. this today. I pitched the show to the gallery as um, a tribute to my brother because he was severely disabled, but he fought to stay alive. And he, he was a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, so I pitch it as a tribute to him and as a tribute to my family because if you have that kind of severe disability in a family, the family unit does not survive. We've dealt with many families over the years and they don't, they disintegrate. Whatever flaws there are, are just accentuated and families explode. I actually had a pediatrician come to the show and she stood there and she frowned and she said she's dealt with disabled children and she's not trying to think which of the families survived and she wouldn't think of one family. So it started off as, as a tribute, um, and I accepted it, and I was like, yeah. And then, um, and then he died in, in January, and then kind of none of it made sense. You know, I didn't know what the show was about. I just took everything with all the image, images, all the footage, um, and we went, uh, Hanali got a residency overseas, and we went to Europe for seven weeks. And I started um, walking every day. We were at um, a sculpture park with a crown forest, so it was beautiful. So I could easily go and walk for two, three hours a day without being scared of being mugged. Uh, they don't have any dangerous snakes. So um, I, see, I just walked every day, and then I would go back and I would edit the video and the images. And you so also I, took quite a lot of photographs while you were walking. Doing, yeah. Yes, okay. and I, I tracked the walks and I had a very definite thing that I wanted to deal with the trauma around his death and I wanted to deal then afterwards with his death. So I had about four weeks of that and then we went to Poland um, mm -hmm. and another we, strange connection. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, we went to Poland and we did a hike through the snow, through rivers and um, I had a complete meltdown in a dodgy mountain lodge in Poland where I couldn't wait for a four star hotel or something. And um, then I realized, because I'd been processing all those images and editing it and going through eight millimeter footage that my dad shot of the family up until the point that my brother was born, he then stopped. Um, and then I realized that it's not a tribute, it's a, it's a memorial. Um, because, I mean, when he was born, we lost kind of the family unit because the disability was quite severe. And um, he, on a daily basis, he, as a, as a sibling, you, you look at him and you kind of see what he's losing every day, what you can do, what other children his age can do, and, and you can't. And then, and then he died, and, and the whole family had by then disintegrated. So I realized it was actually also a memorial for the person I was mm -hmm. after the day he was born, and the person I was for the 32 years that I'd had him. And um, so I thought, okay, it's getting clearer. Um, and then I came back and printed all the images, and I think there's about, I don't know, 300, I'm not sure. And then I started putting it on the wall, and they, it's all printed on moleskin pages. So it's my diaries that I tore apart and printed the images on. Mm. So the images are, small images on the wall are little narratives. And then I said to the woman at the gallery that the images that I thought were visually stronger, um, I've printed bigger. So now I've done all the small prints, and then I put up the big images, and then I realized, it's my mother. So the images might not have been chosen visually, that I was drawn to them. So it was my mother and then me and my sister, but because we don't speak, I didn't show her face at all. So it's my mom and then me, and then just the back of my sister's head, all her face is hidden. And then I realized it's gone from a tribute to a memorial to an acknowledgement. And I took my mom there and I stood there and I said to her, we made it. We, we, we survived he, his birth, we survived his life, we loved him, we never let him go for a moment, and we survived his death. And we are standing here today, and that means, that counts for something. Mm -hmm. And so I think the creative process has actually made me deal with things and realize by editing the video and looking at it, and then sticking it on those walls and it looking back at me, and I went, mm -hmm. all right. So just from, Selecting it, pitching it, editing it, to putting it on the walls, it has changed. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I, this is something that I hasn't uh, really yet, um, I, I haven't clarified for myself inside, but I have realized now in the last week um, that in the, 
that in the first few weeks after Andre's death, I was even unable to read. Um, which which was quite a big shock because I start and end every day with reading on, or I, I used to on a regular basis and then suddenly I uh, I would open the books but nothing would happen because I, I couldn't concentrate so my concentration was completely gone and the willingness to even open the, the books and I thought well okay so l let it be writing was almost Im impossible as well it was even difficult for me to open uh, my emails um, or, or to read the letters of condolences that I got. Um, and then, but gradually, and there were also a lot of people around me, which was uh, very unusual for me as well, because I, 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 I love being with people, but um, um, I'm not a crowd person. And, and, but in that process, it was extremely important to have everybody around me. And I know that these people helped me and they allowed me to remain sane. Um, but suddenly, uh, once uh, family members went home and, and, and friends also went back to their lives because they had to, um, I felt there was this moment where I, I, I want to be alone again um, and I want to um, return to writing. It was a very strong impulse. I, I, I wanted to write and my stories were continuing to, to sort of move on in, in my head. No, the stories they, don't stop. Despite everything, they don't stop. But um, I was unable to write. I, the impulses were there. I couldn't write. I, I haven't couldn't. written either. Mm -hmm. okay. the, only the short comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in, in the last week now, before coming here, suddenly I, uh, even though I did a few small texts that I was asked for, like reviews and little essays, I, I did them, but they were a terrible struggle, whereas, whereas I would usually write a review within a few hours. Um, I, I wrote the first one after Andre's death. I think it took me a week to write a text of five or six hundred words. Um, the only thing that was coming to me was the poetry. The really bad. The really the bad, really bad poetry. poetry that no one will ever read. The, my diary. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And and I was able to write the diary even though I haven't I haven't read anything that is in there uh, since then. So I, I, I suspect that it's quite incoherent. Um, that even I might not be able anymore to trace what happened. But in the last week, I suddenly wrote a few texts at a very regular pace. But what I realized is that uh, something um, is not happening while I'm producing this, this text. Andrew was my first reader. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and suddenly they are finished and they are there, but he is no longer there to read them and proofread them as well. Yes. Um, so there is a, like, a sense of that my safety net for writing is gone. And, and, and I only realized this this week, that my, my safety net is completely gone. So even though the creativity is maybe returning and the writing is returning, I feel completely lost because there is nobody to say, this is not good enough or you've done well. Because that feedback is part of the writing process, mm -hmm. especially if you've set it up mm -hmm. that you know, you're writing and under it becomes one process. Mm -hmm.